gotta love kids. I was sitting down with my son Joshua when he was a little boy and we were reading the Bible together and came across this passage where they're quoting Jesus and it says this, Our Lord said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Joshua immediately blurted out, it is not. <laughs> well, you know, the truth is getting stuff is fun. There's nothing wrong with receiving. Matter of fact, there's no giving unless somebody's receiving. But what Jesus was saying is, as wonderful as it is to receive, there is an extra measure of blessing that comes with giving. It really is more blessed to give than to receive. See, when you receive, you're happy. But when you give, somebody else is happy and you're happy. The, the blessing is doubled. Well, today, we're going to be talking about how we can receive the blessing from God while we're giving a blessing to others. Join with us in this service of worship. Uh, you will find out during this time that we are being blessed by some friends in our church who have helped honor the memory of someone they love by providing some things that have blessed our church and will continue to bless us and will continue to bless you on television as well. Thank you so much for joining us today and may the Lord bless you and keep you. Well, good morning. We are so glad that God has brought you into the house of worship today. This is just a marvelous time for us to gather together as the people of God. We have a baptism today. What a blessing for our whole church every time we bring a child into the family of God and embrace that child with the love of God and believe that the presence of God's Holy Spirit abides on that child. So uh, we are looking forward to that. Our children are singing. Lester is dancing. <laughs> we, it, this is going to be a wonderful time of worship. We're so glad that all of you uh, have, have come here to be a part of that. Those of you who are guests, we want to say a special welcome to you and want you to feel like you are... So, in a place where you're part of the family of God. Two quick announcements. Number one, about the gospel bird, chicken. We have five chicken dinners left. And what's that? Sold out. If you did not get a chicken dinner, you are just in trouble. So sorry about that. All right, thank you for letting us know about that late breaking news. Ignore that one. Here's the other one. Uh, maybe you don't get chicken this week. Next week, though, good news, you can give blood. Uh, the blood mobile will be here at the church, and uh, so uh, you've got an announcement about that in your bulletin. Take a look at that, and you can make an appointment to be a part of that. If you think the sermon's going to be a little slow, you can schedule it during the sermon time. <laughs> well, we're glad that you're here for worship, and let's enter into our worship with full joy and with all of our hearts. Would you join me in prayer? Father, this is a great day when we celebrate your goodness and we again have the privilege of coming together, astonishing as it is, into the presence of the living God. So we honor you and bless your name. Uh, we 
ask that as we come now, you would fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God promised to the Israelites that there would be a promised land. There would be milk and honey flowing, and the oil and wine would abound. They found God's promise. Let us find God's promise as we sing of the God of Abraham. May we praise him. Join me in singing. Well, today, it is with joy that we welcome Jimmy and Marriott Miller as they present a small guy with a big name, James Granville Miller, to be baptized. And we're so glad that you're here as a part of it. You know, this is one of those things that he'll never remember. But you know what? We, as his family, will remember this. And you all will remind him about this, how the church in love embraced him as a part of the family of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Jimmy and Mary, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? We do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? We do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Will you nurture both of these precious children, especially today we mentioned little James in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example they may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves, to profess their faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? We will. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include James now before you in your care? With, With God's, God's help, help, we, we will, will proclaim, proclaim the, the good, good news 
and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround James with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his service to others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing Sing to to the the Lord, Lord, all all the earth. earth. Tell Tell of God's God's mercy mercy each day. day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your Spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare Declare his his works works to the nations, his glory glory among among all the peoples. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and the one who receives it to wash away his sin, clothe him in righteousness throughout his life, that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in his final victory. All All praise to you, Eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. I already know, but I want to ask, what name is given this child? James Granville Miller, we baptize baptize you in the name name of the the Father, Father, and of the the Son, and and of of the the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, it's been the custom in the church for centuries, I guess millennia, that the one baptizing a person takes just a drop of oil and puts the sign of the cross on the forehead of the one being baptized. This is a sign of uh, the Holy Spirit's presence ever watching over this child, even when he is not aware of it. And of course, we remember how Jesus uh, reminded us we need to become like little children, and it could be that they understand more than we as adults do. Well, I'm gonna ask Jimmy and Marriott if they will, um, if they will go ahead and go to the altar and light the baptismal candle. As they do that, we remind ourselves of two Bible verses. One, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But then Jesus said this, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So today, the light of Christ shines more brightly because of little James. So let's sing to him God's blessing. we go to the Lord in prayer, let us take a moment of silence just to personally connect with God. Then I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer. Then we'll join together in the Lord's prayer. So let's pray. Lord God, we acknowledge you as our creator and liberator. You are the one who brought the captives out of Egypt and delivered them from the oppression of slavery. You gave them laws which shaped how they were to relate to you, 
to each other and to the world. You are the one who has brought us out of our personal Egypts, delivering us, freeing us to be the people you created us to be, unshackling us from sin. Your law of love has been written on our hearts, freeing us to rightly relate to you, to each other, and our world. Then as now you implore people to worship only you. So in this time of worship, help us focus on you, O God, as the priority of our lives. See beyond the masks we put on behind our pleasant exteriors. Meet us at our deepest need. Remind us of your steadfast love. Forgive us, for we get so caught up in ourselves. Give us zeal for you and your kingdom. Come, Lord Jesus, help us resist a knee-jerk reaction to life's circumstances. But help us throw ourselves into the arms of Jesus to give thanks that with him we have all we need. Give us generous spirits like yours. Help us to have minds transformed by things eternal and give us, let us target good and avoid evil, chase out all the clutter in our souls that we may bring unencumbered hearts to you. Hear our prayers today for those who need healing of body and of spirit. Bind up broken hearts and drive away disease. Bring peace to those who are nearing the end of life and patience to those who are learning to live with chronic illness. Help those who are caught up in conflict to think clearly and to remain committed to fairness, even when it seems to put them at a disadvantage. Help leaders everywhere hear and respond to people who are crying out for justice and peace here and around the world. Be strong in the lives of missionaries who carry your word to those who have yet to hear. Protect them and give them fruit. And may we be fruitful people as well, right here in Valdosta. We give you thanks for the assurance of your love made known in your son Jesus, who taught us to pray with boldness. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning, welcome. We continue our worship as we sing 295, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. We're beginning with the second stanza. The first and last stanzas are the same. So we are going to glory in the cross of Jesus Christ as we sing. But when the woes of life overtake it, hopes deceive and fears annoy. Sing with me, the cross of Christ. seated. Well, we will invite our ushers to come forward, and while they're on their way, let me just mention to you that this is a day uh, of special gratitude for us here in our church. Uh, all of us who are 845 regulars remember with so much love Joe Mixon, and many of you knew Joe. Well, Joe has gone to heaven, and his family has made a gift in his memory uh, that has three parts to it. Our sound system was on its last leg, and that leg was crippled. Uh, we've been able to get a whole new soundboard. Uh, they've helped us move from uh, our regular low-definition TV to get high-def cameras. All of you, all of us, watch high-definition stuff on TV. My best guess is after they see me in high-definition, we'll get calls asking to go back to low-definition. <laughs> and then there's a third thing that we all are invited to be a part of. As soon as this service is over, and I'll remind you about this, we will just uh, exit out towards the parking lot, which is across from our fellowship hall, we are going to uh, dedicate the third part of the gift, which is a beautiful little uh, prayer garden in Joe's memory. Uh, it's got a couple of benches out there and a couple of trees. It'll be a beautiful place where for years and years to come, people will be able to come and meet God and receive His peace and blessing. So today is a day of deep gratitude for us, and I want to say thank you to all of you who are faithfully giving for God's work. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, today we have so much for which to be grateful, but we would just name uh, Joe Mixon. We love Joe, we miss him, and we're so glad that when he slipped away from our arms, he just slipped into the arms of Jesus. In the meantime, we thank you for his precious family, who's able to, some of whom are able to be here today. And we celebrate your goodness. And now, as we continue in this time of worship, would you remind us that uh, every good gift comes from you, and let us give our best to the Master. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just remind you during the offering, if you would sign the attendance register uh, that is in your pew and pass it down, we would be grateful.
Thank you, choir. Many of you will uh, recognize that the words come from Philippians chapter 3, a great passage about uh, how God works in us as we press on towards the prize for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. All right, I want to start today by asking a question. Don't be ashamed of this, but I'd like to see hands. How many of you grew up in a Baptist church? Okay, did anybody grow up in a Methodist church? I, I mean, this place is just loaded. Well, I, I want to tell you, I love my Baptist friends. Those of you who grew up in a Baptist church, you'll remember that uh, usually around Christmas time, there is a special missions offering that is received in Baptist churches all around the country, maybe all across the world, called the Lottie Moon Offering. I love to ask my Baptist friends, I say, um, do you know what the story is about Lottie Moon? And they go, uh, no. Well, let me tell you the story. It's wonderful. People always ask me, since my name is Moon, you know, are we related? I wish we were, but I can't prove anything. Here's the deal. Lottie Moon was a missionary in China, and during the time that she was there, a terrible famine uh, came across the land. Well, they had in the mission a kind of a food pantry, and people would come to try to get some help, and she gave the food until they were just out of food. And so finally, she told the people, I'm sorry, there's just nothing left. 
Well, they went away, and then she went to have her dinner and opened up her own pantry and found she had food. And she thought, now, why is it that I should have food to eat and send people away who are hungry? And she began to give her own food away. Sometime later, some other missionary friends came and uh, came to visit her and found her almost starved to death. So they immediately put her on a ship to go to Japan where she could get good medical care, but before she could get there, she died, literally starved to death. Well, this story of such incredible generosity uh, captivated the, the lives of people, and so the Baptist church just picked up on that, and so every year to honor her memory and to do the work of missions, they ask people to sacrificially give for the Lottie Moon offering. So, just to be clear here, here's what I'm asking you to do. Starve yourself to death. (laughs) No, actually not. But here's what I am telling you to do. And you've probably never heard a preacher say this to you before. So, here's what I'm telling you to do. Keep your money. I'm telling you, keep your money. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. He said, do not, you all know what those words mean, okay? This is Jesus, do not. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break through and steal. Then he says, do store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So, what I want to tell you, Jesus is concerned that you keep your money. And so, in order to keep your money, here's what Jesus says, give it away. Because, you see, every one of us, from the richest person to the poorest person, when we die, how much do we leave behind? We leave it all. And here is the principle that I want to remind us of today. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. That's the treasure principle. You can't keep it with you, but you can send it on ahead. God wants you to keep your money. See, there's a precedent for this in 2 Corinthians. Paul is writing to the people there. The folks over, the Christians in Jerusalem are going through a famine, and the people in Corinth said, we want to help them out. And Paul said, y'all are so poor, you're barely keeping it together. But they said, we don't care, we still want to give something. And here's what Paul wrote. He said, out of your poverty welled up generosity. See, it wasn't that they had to give, you couldn't stop them from giving. Because they cared about others. There was a spirit of generosity in them that wanted to express itself. So, let's take a look at an interesting passage of Scripture from Ecclesiastes chapter 11. You have probably not been to Ecclesiastes in a long time. Some of you are thinking, there's a book named Ecclesiastes. (laughs) This is not one of the ones we wind up in a lot, but there's an interesting passage of Scripture here in chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 6. Listen to this. Send your grain across the seas, and in time, profits will flow back to you. We're going to come back to that verse in another translation in just a moment. So, send your grain across the seas, and in time, profits will flow back to you. But divide your investments among many places, for you do not know what risks might lie ahead. When clouds are heavy, the rains come down. Whether a tree falls north or south, it stays where it falls. Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. Just as you cannot understand the path of the wind or the mystery of a tiny baby growing in its mother's womb, so you cannot understand the activity of God who does all things. Plant your seed in the morning and keep busy all afternoon, for you don't know if profit will come from one activity or another, or maybe both. Now, here's what that passage says, that first verse says in the King James Version, it says, cast your bread upon the waters, 
and you will find it after many days. I never knew what on earth that was talking about. Here's what I always thought. Cast your bread upon the waters, and in about two seconds, it'll be soggy. <laughs> what is, on earth does this mean? Well, I, I did some checking and some commentaries, and there were at least three different uh, ideas about this. Number one, they said uh, that many times people would plant in a flooded field, and what you do is you go to that flooded field, and you cast your bread on the water, and then you go around and stomp it all down and get the grain down inside there, and get the seed down in there, and then after a while, it grows up and you get a harvest. Another group of people thought, well, it's about when sailors come in after they've been away for a long time, share your bread with them. And who knows, maybe after some time when they come back, they may share something good with you. Or, as the passage puts it in the New Living Translation, which we read today, Send your grain off with the sailors, and they'll take it across the sea and sell it, and then they'll bring you back a profit. Whichever one of these, though, they all make exactly the same point, and it's simply this. Go ahead and invest something if you ever expect to make a profit back. Go ahead and give in order that you may get a profit later on. Now, there are four important biblical principles here in chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. First, invest. You've got to turn loose of the money if you ever hope to get a return. Two, diversify, because you can't tell whether any particular uh, investment will bring a profit or not. Many of us invest in mutual funds, for example. Third, start now. Don't wait around for another time. Don't wait till there's something completely without risk or you'll never start. And then fourth, keep at the mission of giving generously all your life. Now understand, all of these principles involve a certain amount of risk. And if you, but here's the greatest risk of all. If you don't do anything, you will get no return. For example, when a farmer tosses out his seed and plants it in the ground, there is no guarantee that he will reap a harvest. But I can make a 100% guarantee, and that is that if he does not plant his seed, he will not get a harvest. We've got to plant if we are going to expect to reap. You remember in the parable of the talents where the master leaves and he leaves some money with uh, some of his servants? He gives one five bags of gold, gives one two bags of gold, and gives one guy one bag of gold. And the guy with five invests, invests it. Is investing risky? Sure it is. You never know how the returns, but he invests it, he gets five more. The guy with two, he invests it, he makes two more. The guy with one bag, what's he do with it? Digs a hole and sticks it in the ground. He says, you know, it's risky out there, and I might lose this. So he doesn't do anything. When he gives it back to the master, the master is not angry at him because he didn't make a profit. He's angry at him because he didn't do anything. If you and I will not risk giving our money, if we will not risk investing in the lives of other people, if we will not risk investing in the kingdom of God, the fact is we will simply get no return. You know, so often we're reluctant to talk about money because we think, well, God's trying to get money out of us. I hope you're hearing the clear message of the Scripture, the words of Jesus. He wants you to give because He wants you to keep your money. Listen, everything we hoard and clutch for ourselves, we will leave behind. It is only that which we give away that we will ultimately keep. That is what Randy Alcorn calls the treasure principle. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. I remind our finance committee uh, of a couple things periodically. You know, we've got a group, an excellent group of godly, wonderful men and women who gather together to deal responsibly with the stewardship of our finances here at the church. You know, I mean, we just talk about dollars and cents and, you know, how to be wise uh, stewards of that money. And I remind them about two principles every now and then. At the end of a meeting, often when we've been talking about money, I remind them, first of all, 
that the right use of money is itself a ministry in our church. We want to use it wisely. And the second thing is money enables ministry. If we didn't have money, we, we couldn't do any of the stuff that we do around here. So nobody's, you know, excited about the money itself. What we are about in the finance committee and, and about the church is not about money. It's about what money enables us to do in order to do wise ministry. Now, in the passage today, it uses two really interesting examples. It says, you know, we see the wind, what the wind's doing out here, but nobody knows how the wind works. And, and how about with a, a baby growing in a mother's womb says, you know, we don't know how that works. And the truth is, we know a lot more about how a baby grows in a womb now than they did back then. But I'm telling you, when you see these pictures of babies in the mother's womb, the more we know, the more astonishing it is. And his point is, look, if God is able to do all that stuff, trust me. He can take care of your investments. So, it says, go ahead and be generous. Give so that others can be blessed. You know, in, the, in Luke, it tells us, give and it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, flowing over into your lap. Now, I want to be clear. We're not talking about, okay, let's give so we can get. We're not talking about, okay, if I give God $1, He's going to give me 10 back. This is not about a get-rich quick scheme. This is a, a not about uh, something that's all self-serving. But the picture that Luke has is of people who would go to get uh, grain, say, from the, from the uh, uh, market, and they might have a can of some kind, a container of some kind, and you'd go and you'd get it filled up with grain. Now, somebody who was trying to beat you out of some money after you paid him, would try and fill it up with as much fluff as they could. But if you really want to get it full, you shake it down, you know, you can make some more room. And that's what Luke's saying. He said, when you, when you give, you know, what you get back from God is a, a good measure, and then he shakes it down, pours some more in, and if you can imagine, you better hold it like this, because you're going to get an overflow. Now, that's the way that God works in us. When we are generous, when we love to give, when we are about touching other people with God's grace, there's always a two-way blessing. The other people are blessed, and the person who's giving is blessed. You cannot bless other people with your generosity without the blessing coming back. Now, you know, this Sunday is so appropriate for this theme. We're talking during Lent here. You remember Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Well, our theme for Lent this year is it is not finished. And we've been talking about some things that are not yet completed. We talked about unity, for example, how we're still working on that. Generosity is one of those things where we're still working on because God has put in the hands of Christians enough resources to change our world. The problem is we're still holding on to them. And God wants for us to be generous people. And so we want to uh, be a part of those who are making a difference. Now, two things today. I already mentioned to you about uh, our dear friend Joe Mixon. His family's here with us today. And they've generously given out of Joe's estate so that we're able to have decent sound here, upgrade our TV, and this wonderful prayer garden, which will be for anybody and everybody will be welcome there. What a wonderful legacy of love. A second thing is that Gene Roundtree, who was a faithful part of our church for so many years, you sit right over there. Jean died this week, and we had her funeral. This Steinway piano was uh, given by Jean out of the inheritance she received from her father. As a matter of fact, Jean and her sister both gave to their respective churches the piano. Now, you and I, you may not know that Jean gave that, but we have Sunday after Sunday after Sunday been blessed by that beautiful music uh, that uh, Linda plays for us over there. And because of Jean's generosity, now even though she's gone to heaven, even though Joe's gone to heaven, we are still blessed by their ministry. So I want to just 
wrap up by uh, offering one suggestion to you, and I'm, I need to be honest with you, it really hadn't occurred much to me until I had a, a heard a friend talk about the final tithe or legacy giving. And that is to put something in your will that leaves some part of your uh, money that you leave behind to the church or to some ministry that, that you love. I just really hadn't thought about it. You know, and then I asked uh, our Wednesday night supper crowd, we were talking about this, you know, I've got some money in my will that is set aside for the Rotary Club. I'm uh, part of Rotary. It's a great organization. Do you know why I have that in my will? They asked me for it. And I, if they hadn't asked me, I would, don't guess I'd have given it. I just had, wouldn't have thought about it. Well, I am asking you Maybe over lunch today with, uh, you know, husband and wife, or if you're single, you give some thought over your chicken dinner um, about putting that in your will. I mean, I want to leave behind, you know, the bulk of my resources for Betty and uh, in, when she dies for our children, but what a great idea that we can have a continuing ministry through a legacy gift. So I just invite you to, to think about that. All I had to do was call up my good attorney friend, Steve Gupton, and say, hey, Steve, you know, just add this onto my will, and so he does, and there it is. You know, it's not a difficult thing, but it's a wonderful way of making an impact. Here's this story. I've told this to you before, but it is so true and so powerful. There was a man in uh, about 1920, very wealthy businessman, who gave some money to build an entire school in Africa. So uh, it, it was a wonderful thing that he did. 1929, anybody remember what may have happened then? Great Depression. He lost everything and never recovered it. Uh, for the rest of his life, he just lived in very modest means and uh, just sort of survived. Well, on the 10-year anniversary of the school, they uh, tried to find this guy because they wanted to bring him over to the, uh, to the school for their 10th anniversary celebration. So they sent a guy over here to America, searched around, finally found the guy, and went to him and said, hey, we're from the school that you built. And the man said, oh, I'm so sorry. I lost everything. I don't have any more money to give you. No, 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 they said. We didn't come to ask you for anything. We came to say thank you, and we'd like to take you over to Africa to this school so you can be there for the graduation for our 10th anniversary. They took him over there. The man watched as young men and women walked across the stage with a whole new future that they never would have had apart from that education. And the, the man who had given the money for the school just watched with tears streaming down his face. And then he leaned over to the president of that school and he said, you know what? I just realized the only money that I have kept is what I gave away. What a powerful word. In the end, we'll leave it all behind. But we can send it on ahead. There's a man who said, made, made this statement. He said, when I give, I'm saying, Lord, I love you. Remember, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we might as well be honest with you. We always get a little squeamish when somebody talks about money because, well, we put so much of our security in money and stuff. May we really hear today what Jesus is saying, that you just... You know, nothing wrong with stuff, but it's not secure. It, it can be here today and gone tomorrow. What we want to do is be wise stewards of what you've given to us. So today, I pray that you would guard every one of us from the great danger of hearing God's Word and then doing nothing about it. Instead, we want to be faithful in hearing your Word and being obedient. I pray that husbands and wives all across our congregation will go home and single people go home and, and think about, talk about, well, 
what is it that God wants us to do? Uh, is there a real spirit of generosity in me, or is this something that God needs to grow? Do I need to start being more generous in my giving? And then I, I pray that there'll be many of us who will say, you know, I never even thought about leaving, you know, some money in my will for this church or for some other ministry or mission that is dear to my heart. And but what a wonderful blessing that would be that we would go ahead and take an action step on that, call up our attorney, just get, it can be done in just a few minutes and taken care of, and yet it can have an impact that will last way beyond our lives. And so today we're seeing that actually lived out through the legacy giving of, of Joe Mixon and of Gene Roundtree. So we are grateful. Well, thank you, Father, for gathering us together. We love you, and we offer this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Well, what a great time of worship together. We're going to stand and sing our, just the first and last verses of our closing hymn, uh, which is, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed? And, and we're going to uh, just sing that together, and then I'm going to offer the benediction. The choir will sing the amen, and then we will all uh, head on out that way. And if you'll head down the street, I've already talked with our uh, police officer who's out there. I said, when you see me leading the people as Moses led the children of Israel, uh, not across the Red Sea, but across Valley Street, you know, just keep us from getting that rundown feeling. So he's going to stop traffic, and we'll all just go across, and it's down, uh, just a, a little ways down across from our fellowship hall, a beautiful prayer area, and I'm so glad the Mixon family's uh, here, they will be a part of that uh, very brief service out there where we will dedicate that land to God. So, would you stand with me? We're just going to sing the first and last verses, and then we'll head on over. What a privilege we have to be able to keep the things God has given to us by giving them away. You know, a heart that is a generous heart, that loves to give, that loves to bless others, is always going to be a happy heart. It will always be a fulfilled heart. So I want to invite you to the great joy and blessing of giving. And would you consider too in your giving whether you want to leave something in your will that will bless others after you have left this life and gone to heaven. Well, thank you so much for worshiping with us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.